Can you hear me now? Yeah, now you're back. It just went blank for a second there. So, yeah, big ups, man. Like, big ups to you for, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, come learn. Come, uh, you know what I'm saying? Come over here. Talk to us. So, I can't really, I can't fault you for that, man. That's that's a lot more than what a lot more people would do. Top. So, uh, a talk to the brave read? Oh, no. Nah, not for real, man. Like, I'm more of a literary dude. Like, I'm more, like, learn. Like, uh, you know, Kasati Vit, you know, like, not really. Kasati. Like, I think you probably speak more Hebrew than I do. Uh, I already told you, like, I'm more of a literary guy. But, like, I can understand most of what you're saying. But, like okay. I said, I'm not really a conversational. Uh, I know you lived in Israel. I was told you lived in Israel for some period of time, or you may even grew up as a Jew. I heard a lot of different things. I don't know what's really true. Yeah, I was a Jew. I was uh, a Jew for many years. I made Aliyah to Israel in 2006. I still live there. So uh, that part's true, but I no Who longer- Who am I speaking practice. with? Is this Rabbi Bird? Yeah. Sorry. That's the, that's the I thought you lived in the Philippines. I do, oh, I'm no, in the I, Philippines. I'm sorry. I'm in the Philippines now, but I'm not a citizen here. I'm a citizen of Israel. Okay. I moved to Israel and I left the United States in 2006 for good and I became a citizen of Israel. So that's that's the country that's, you know, my passport and all that stuff. I'm only a tourist in the Philippines, but I live here, but I'm not a citizen of the Philippines. I've been living here for many years, but I'm not a citizen here. I'm just a, still technically a tourist. So I have to leave and come back and all that stuff to read on my visa and all that stuff, but I'm not a citizen here. What is it like there? Like why and why the Philippines, may I ask, if that's okay? Uh, the Philippines for us is the destination of the wilderness that the scriptures prophesy about. And that's, that's where we believe the scriptures are telling us to congregate in order for our people to be restored so that we can get some breathing space and focus on ourselves and isolate ourselves and restore ourselves without any interference from, you know, the man who has been actively making sure we don't congregate and we don't prosper and we don't succeed that's why the philippines is important to us okay uh can i ask you a question um i heard uh, a couple of things maybe i'm going to go through the things i heard and you can tell me if it's true or not is sure. that okay yeah so i heard that you you consider yourself an ebonite which means that you have some aspects of christianity mixed with aspects of i would say judaism i'm sure you would say the ancient ways or something like that. Would you want we to explain only, that? We only accept the definition of the Ebionites that was given by the first person who mentioned the term. There's all types of definitions of Ebionite, but we only we only subscribe to the very first definition of the term that was given by the Bishop of Lyons Gaul in, in the second century CE named Irenaeus. That's whose definition we use. You might be using Epiphanes, so you might be using origin, you might be using some other church writer's definition of that term, but we only answer to the one that was first given by Irenaeus, which is that these people were, you know, quote unquote, Israelites by blood. Um, they did believe in the Messiah, but they did not believe in any of the Christian doctrine that talked about him. They rejected Paul as a liar. They rejected the entire Greek New Testament. They did not see him as divine. They just saw him as a man, a prophet. Okay. He did miracles, but so did all the other prophets. There's nothing, nothing special about that. He's not an object of worship. We do not pray to him. Okay. He's just our brother. That's the way we look at him. That's the way the ancient Ebionites of old saw him just as a man. Later on, he was changed by the heathens into something, you know, an idol of worship. We don't, that's not the guy we're talking about. We hate that guy. Okay. We despise that guy. And every chance we get, we try to point that out to people, but they, you know, they want to just lump us in with these camps and these churches. And that's not, it's not who we are at all. If they listen to us, they would consider us demons. They would think that we are, <laughs> you know, we're, the, we're Satan. If they hear us talk about Christians. Him, yeah. The Christians, Christians are in the camps. All of them, Christians, camps, you name it. If they hear us really talk about him, they would think that we are all devils and demons and Satans, the way we talk about Jesus. 
because we don't we don't have anything nice to say about him. He's a fifth. He's a myth. He's a fiction. He's not real. He's made up. Wait, of so you have, so you don't have any, you don't feel any connection at all to Jesus, Yahweh Shai, whatever no. you, whatever term. You don't, you no. feel no connection at all. No, that's a made up guy. Not, the, the real guy is totally different. That's a made up guy. That's a fiction. Okay. The real, the real figure, you feel connection to the, what you see is the real figure. Yeah, there was a historical figure. We have references to a historical person that cannot be refuted. I know, I know there's so many attempts out there to say that he was never real. You can't just plump a fictionary character in the midst of all these attested real people and no one not know about it until the 20th century. That's not plausible. There was a real person, but he was just a man, just a man. He was not claiming to be God. He didn't ask his disciples to pray to him as God. He did none of those things that the church in these camps say he did and th that the way they talk about him now. All that's a lie. It's a very convincing argument, right? Because I struggled this, with this myself. Um, I don't want to go off too far in it because it's kind of off the subject, but like, was Jesus a real person or not, right? And obviously what you're saying is very compelling, right? You're saying like, how can all these people have all these testimonies basically about Official. I'm going to call him Jesus for lack of a better term. Right. Just right. To, I'll call him, call him Jesus because that's what it, that's what he's written in the Greek or whatever. Right. Um, right. Esos or something. Let's say Jesus, Jesus, we'll just say Jesus. So I guess, I guess my counter argument would be, our question would be, right. You have Hercules, you have Dionysus, you have Isis, you have Osiris. Just because a lot of people attested to him, does it mean all these figures were true too? Why is it that no, Jesus but usually, can't be a myth, but you're right. Usually these myths start with something that's true, a kernel of truth. And then over time, it gets elaborated upon and becomes this myth, right? Like the gods of Egypt, those gods, Osiris, Seth, and all that crap, they were probably real people at one point who did some, you know, great things. They were leaders and kings, and, you know, they were highly revered at, during their time. But then when they died, people began to deify them and worship them as gods, make them bigger than what they were, and turn them into something mm -hmm. else. But, you know, in the beginning, that those were probably genuine, genuinely real people who lived and, you know, did, did great things. And then when they were gone, you know, folks went crazy and, did, and, and went nuts and made them into gods and worshiped them, made temples and prayer books and religions and all that crap off of these real people. That's what, that's what we believe happened to our brother. We call him <laughs> our brother, not our God, not our savior, none of that. That's, that's not true. He's just our brother. And people turned him into something that he was never, he never meant to be. Can I ask a question? So let's, if he's a prophet, let's say, for lack of a better term, Jesus is a normal guy. He's a normal prophet. So why focus on him? You know, you have all these prophets. I think there's 44 prophets. We don't I, focus I on him. pull that number out of nowhere. Okay. We, okay. We don't so he's focus just another on prophet. I mean, another we, prophet. We, we focus on all the prophets, not just him. We don't make him okay. like, uh, like I said, he's not our savior. We do believe okay. that he has another role to play in the future, but he's not someone who we look to as the savior of our people. He came to tell so us why to does keep he, Torah. Sorry. Well, because he was the last one before the destruction of our nation, 70. That's what makes, one of the reasons that makes him so significant is that he came just before the, the Haram, just before the destruction of our nation. He told our people that that was going to happen so you know and since that time there hasn't been any prophets right since i mean i don't count muhammad or any of those other later day people as prophets so for our people he was the last since since the curses really kicked in of the prophets for our people and he told the people you need to keep the commandments right you need to you need to, you need to uh, worship the father not anyone else but him keep his commandments and because of your wickedness, you know, this place is going to be destroyed soon. That's what, he, that's what makes him significant, is that he came at a time, like I said, we were about to enter a paradigm shift, lose our nation, right, be scattered among these heathens, and eventually lose our, our name, our language, our everything, right? And he talked about all that. That's what makes him significant. So I have two, I have two questions about the New Testament, and I guess I want to hear you know, your view on them. Obviously, like, you have an incredible following. I've run into people that are students of yours all over the place. So clearly you have a compelling message and you have a lot to say. 
And um, I just want to hear how you really, I'm just trying to learn about you on this call and not really, you know, I'm just trying to learn more about how you think about things. And sure. so I guess my question would be about the New Testament. So basically, right, the Jewish view is at least the way it's developed is to reject things that are written in Greek or Latin. Right. If we can't find it in Greek and Latin, like you have like Ben Shedrick, right? Ben Shedrick, uh, we know because we have a, a piece of it in the Dead Sea Scrolls and other things, other writings that one time it wasn't Hebrew, but we only have a small fragment of the Hebrew. So Jews reject it because, you know, who knows what the Greeks did to it, right? They translated, who knows what they did to it. So I guess my question would be, why do you trust the New Testament? It's only in Greek. It's only in Greek. We don't trust Latin. the New Testament. We don't trust the New Testament. You trust we, it, but you, you know, I mean, guess what I'm saying? I'm just what I'm asking you. All right. I mean, let me trust it enough to, I'm just, let me just make sure I make my question clear. You trust it enough to say like, Jesus said this, Jesus said that, Jesus made no, this thing. He no, we do don't. This no, no, we don't. That's why I was getting ready to tell you. Okay. The Greek New Testament, we do not trust at all. We don't trust it at all. The only thing we trust, okay, we have we have testimony from the earliest part of church history that the original gospel, the original account of his words and deeds was written in Hebrew, okay? All of the church fathers, all the early church fathers say that. And it was only one gospel written, written by the apostle Matthew, okay? Now, Papias, the early church father, said that that was the only gospel written. And then all these other gospels were translations attempting to either understand that and doing the best they could but not doing it accurately they were making these translations into aramaic and into greek were inaccurate and, and they recognized that that the original was hebrew so what we've done is we've simply said okay look if he's real right and there must be some record of this hebrew text right it may not come it may not have come down to us in perfect condition it may have been edited we we understand that that's how humans are when, when documents are in the wrong hands they get copied and copied and copied and, you know, things get changed. So we said there must be a record. And sure enough, there is. Okay, in the 14th century, a, a Jewish rabbi by the name of, of, of Ibn Shapru um, Shem Tov had, had a full, a complete copy of this gospel, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the details of it are a disaster to the Greek New Testament, mm -hmm. a disaster. Because in this document, he can, it actually condemns the Greek New Testament. There are parts of it, and we can see that where, has, where the document has been edited to make it agree with the Greek uh, translation. But we can uh, we can see that because of the the type. If you if you can if you speak Hebrew and read Hebrew fluently, you can read a Hebrew document and see what parts are ancient, like biblical Hebrew, versus what parts are late Mishnaic or later Hebrew. And we can see in this document when when an editor has tried to update or or manipulate the text. To make it look like to make it agree with the greek and we simply extract those parts but when you take all that out and you look at this this document this is a first and i'm not the, i'm not the only one who said this you don't have to take my view on this okay the first person to publish this manuscript was george howard in the 1980s or 1990s early 1990s and he said Can uh, I, he, got, he got a lot of I, criticism but I he said that this document second. is first century hebrew go I'll ahead pause you one second first of all how should i refer to you respectfully if i want to ask you a question Ach is fine. I refer to you as Ravenous Bird. Ach, okay. Ach is fine. My other question is, can you tell me where can I find this document? Is there is it available online? Yeah, it's, and then it's, it's the Hebrew. It's the Hebrew Matthew by George Howard. George Howard. Okay, but you have to be you have to be aware of how he's presenting this manuscript. He they, there were there are several copies of this document, several manuscripts. He only published the one that has the you know the one that was best preserved in terms of the quality of the, of the parchment. Right. But he, in the apparatus, in that book, he talks about other manuscripts and how they differ. And he tells you that it's clear that over time, these these manuscripts were edited to make them agree with the Greek Matthew. But when you remove all that, what you have is a polemic treatise that attacks the Greek New Testament and condemns it. In this in this Hebrew Matthew, there is nothing about him being a God born of a virgin, um, dying for sins, none of that. And he even says in this Hebrew Matthew that, that, that this gospel that will say that about him, that will say that he died for the sins of the world and that, he, that he's somehow God, he must pray. That gospel that will, that, that will become popular about him is an abomination. That's why the church has censored this book 
and made sure that the masses don't know about it. That's why you're asking me how to find it right now. Because the church yeah. has censored it. Why why so long? Why mm -hmm. why did it take until let's say that let's say that was you say the gospels were written around hundred C C E. No, I'm saying they were written I'm saying they were written in the thirties and forties C E. Okay. Let's say they were written in thirties or forties C E, which would have been when Jesus, for lack of a better term, was still alive. Right? No, he 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 would have been lynched in thirty four. I believe that the Hebrew Matthew was written right after that. Not, it didn't take years to do this. It was written in, in like 35, 36. And like I said, that was the only okay. one written. All these other gospels that came later were attempts, attempts to tell the story and they got it wrong because they were not made. So let's by say for, people. let's say I'm not going to dispute any of that. Let's just, I'm just trying to understand why did it take 1400 years for such a document to appear? And where was it? Because, such a document, right? Well, in the to hands you and I, the Jews, just give me a second. Give me a second. In the hands of the Jews, that's a very powerful weapon, right? Because the Jews this whole time are getting persecuted um, by the Christians, basically from not 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 that early, but we're talking about from the year like 200 or so. Is that right? They're persecuted. They're killed. They're there's different by the Roman Empire and then blah 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 and such and such as became Christian and such and such. That's a powerful weapon. If you got this. If you have this this document, in, in why wouldn't way? you? What happened to it? Well, if you can show that the Christian Bible is a the New Testament is a forgery, and it's right. actually you have a real in your hands, you have a real Hebrew language original, and that their gospel is a translated forgery, it's a very powerful weapon. The Muslims well, yeah, would love is. to have it. The, it's a the powerful Muslims weapon would love for to us. have that, right? The well, I don't know about I don't know about that. that. I think the Muslims would not want to have that because they want That's their they want argument. to present themselves Sorry. as the as the latest revelation, the final revelation. But Islam but, tries to make itself to be the you know the the full the fulfillment of all this stuff, not the you know not the co partner of it, but sort of the fulfillment, the last revelation. But what I would say to you is that why is it taking so long? Number one, to us it seems like it's taking so long, but this manuscript has been around. It's been circulating in Europe amongst you know amongst. Uh, the people for centuries, but he said in this book, he said that the the brothers would disappear, and the, but the gates of hell should not prevail. In other words, there will be a time when this document, this this truth, would be suppressed, and this madness would spread about him. That there would be a lie. He said that. He said it would go all over the world and become popular. This lie about him until you know we got to the end times, and when our people begin to wake up. Like if you believe that the people who came across the Middle Passage are the descendants of the Israelites. Well, what's, what, I don't know if you believe that or not, but what's taken them so long? Why has it been all these centuries for that truth to, to be finally manifested? It, it's because it wasn't time yet. It wasn't time yet. We had to go through the curses. Okay. We, had to, we had to fulfill the book and go through all that, all that horrific punishment for the sins of our ancestors before it was time for that generation to wake up and say, okay, let's let's start over and, and see where we went, went wrong and put this back together again. That's why. Okay. I mean, so, okay. I, I, I can't really argue, say anything about that. So I guess my next question would be, Shalom, um, can I just quickly just say something quickly? Sorry to interrupt, but just shalom, shalom. Um, in, 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 in your search for the um, George Howard Hebrew Matthew, I just want to say this as well. There's two parts. Normally, when you, when you put it on Google, they'll just give you part one, yeah, which has part the full two. text. But get part two is, is when he analyzes everything. It's, it's essential that you read part two as well so you can get an understanding of that. I just wanted to make sure that you did that. Shalom. Yeah, it's hard to find part one and part two now. You can get part one online for free. You can download the whole thing, thing for free. But part two is tough to find. So, but yeah, you do, you do need part two, because that's when he really goes in deep in depth, analyzes the text, shows your relationship between this manuscript and other documents claiming to be written by Matthew, because there's a few others that are out there that's claiming to be from Matthew. Um, but he shows you how this is the only one that has authentic biblical Hebrew, which, which a, you know, a Jewish rabbi trying to attack this book would not imitate. He would not try to make the book look authentic. He would try to, you know, do as much as he could to discredit the book. And George Howard points out that that's one of the reasons why we need to take this book seriously, because the Jews did not attack the Greek Matthew. They didn't waste their time with the Greek Matthew. They didn't waste their time with the Greek John and the Greek Mark and the Greek Luke. They didn't waste their time with those books. Those books were obviously bullshit. But this one, 
this one they took seriously. This one they had a <laughs> they had a problem with, and they had, did it, they did it, they did a lot to try to suppress it. This one print this I one mean, gave, this one gave them a problem. From from a Jewish perspective, right? Without knowing the history of this work, I've never heard of this work. So you really taught me something already. I could really sink my teeth into. But like from a Jewish perspective, if you can show that Jesus is just a regular guy, that's a powerful, for lack of a better term, apologetic tool. I mean, most Judea, for Judaism. most rabbis, most that's Jewish a, that's rabbis. What, most, if you ever listen to uh, what's his name, there's a, there's a lot of Jewish rabbis out there that are saying that. Talking about Kovia Singer, right? Yeah, no. he's. I love him. He's great. He's yeah. he's another one. Yeah, if yeah, you really listen to him, he's, he's not rejecting yeah. that this this guy existed. He's just saying this book, this New Testament, is not telling you the truth about him, and that's what we're saying. Okay. We're saying the same thing. I'm saying he from a, a real perspective. Person. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I, I really need to work no, better on my discipline. I'm listening. Yeah, I was just saying, saying that thing, so. from a, I'm just saying I personally don't see why Jews would attack such a book. And, you know, I'd have to look into the history and see what I can find. Um, definitely gave me something new I never heard of. But like just from a Jewish perspective, even today, I don't see why any Jews would attack this book. If he was a real guy, he was alive. Um, there's many perspectives on. He would, on they would attack Yashka. it. They would attack it because he attacked. He attacked rabbinic Judaism. He attacked the very foundations. Of yeah, it. but he's not the first or the last. There's been a, a whole string. Every generation, there's a new guy who attacked Judaism. You had the Frankens, you had the Jacobins. You had every generation. We have a new guy. It's not. It's not special. It's well, not look something what, worth. But what? Right. But you're saying they special, wouldn't reject right? the book. Why do? Why do? Why do rabbinic Jews reject the Karaite movement? I lived in Israel for years. They, they don't. They, they don't. They're, they're yes, Jews. Yes, they do. They're accepted, they're accepted. I live in Israel. No, they do not no. accept them as real Jews. They do not. They don't they accept are, the Talmud. The rabbinate, the, oral... the rabbinate rule, the rabbinate rule that they're Jews and that Jewish women are allowed to marry them. No, I'm talking about. That was a problem. They didn't have any women. I'm talking about. They didn't have any women. I'm talking about their halacha. Well, that's different. That's not because that's not because the, they're not accepted. That's because they have different laws I, the, than Jews the do. For instance, Jewish they law mix does meat not, and milk. No, I'm not talking about which their, is, their ancestry. I, I know they recognize them the ancestry as Jews. I'm talking yeah. about religiously, religiously. Religiously, no. yeah, they have they they reject a lot of the tenets of Judaism, but they're not rejected as Jews, right? Well, two different no, things, right? They're not Obviously, rejected you know, ethnically and you know, racially as Jews. No, no, I don't talk about ethnically and racial, that's not true. Jew and Jews are not a race, not an ethnicity, it never was. No, it's I'm, a religious no, category. No, no, no. You are a Jew because okay. of your mom. That is a race. That isn't no, but that's not ethnicity. That's not that's not a race, not ethnicity. Because if your mom, if your mother, right, it's by your mother, right? But it's not because of a race, because I'm not saying there's only I'm not the saying mom, there's different races. I, I'm not saying there's different races of humans. I am saying that Jewish doctrine does recognize a bloodline traced through the mom. That's not the way Judaism understands it. But I'm not I don't argue about that because it's not important. How, to me. how, how long have you been? It's Jewish? not about blood. How you want to question my Judaism? That's that's no, not. No, I'm not. I'm not questioning your Judaism. You Judaism. Don't have to do that. I'm, no, I'm not. That's not true. I'm just asking I'm, you. I'm, I don't know. I'm just telling you, it's not true. How long you have you get, been practicing? It doesn't Judaism. matter. It doesn't matter because they're trying to correct my credibility, trying to attack my credibility, which is not necessary. I didn't attack your credibility. I'm not. Attack, I'm ask asking you a question. How are you Jewish? I'm I can tell Jewish you why. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna shy away from that question. I'm just asking the same question. Okay. You know okay. what? The thing. The thing about it, like I said, the thing about it, I'm willing to talk about my personal background, but I feel like they're using to attack my credibility. The I'm fact not attacking is, your credibility. I'm willing to talk about. You're trying to attack my credibility. You say how long I've been Jewish. That's because not an attack. You don't agree with what I said. You don't agree with what I said. So you I'm want trying to say, understand well, where you're coming from. That's all. I'm trying to understand no, where you are. No, coming no, from. the thing, the the fact, the way you're asking the question just makes me want to answer. answer. I'm half uh, No, no, no. I'm not. Not in that. Why? Context. Why are you not getting defensive? Context. Just because I because asked you how long I'm not getting defensive. I'm not getting defensive because you're attacking my credibility. That's why I am not attacking Jews. It's simple. It's simple. Yes, you are. Jews don't understand it as a bloodline. It's not a. They do. They do though. No. I'm not what making makes, that up. Uh, why is a child born of a Jewish mother a Jew? Because what's Judaism the reasoning says, that we have? Because De why Judaism looks at Deuteronomy seven verses one through four and says the mother is the one who preserves the bloodline. That's not why. the bloodline. Not the bloodline. It is the bloodline. That's not the reasoning. It the is re the way we understand. No, 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 no. That's something that's very different between Hebrews like groups and Jews. 
What are you What are you talking about? Very we, different. We're not talking about Hebrew Israelites right now. It's we're not a bloodline. Israel. It's not a bloodline. Why is the Jewish? Just Just look. You might not agree with me, but I'm telling you how Jews understand it. This is how This is how mainstream Judaism sees the thing. You don't have to agree with me. I can but bring you sources. Doesn't matter. Look, I'm just telling you. You're not whatever reason. Do you belong to Chabad? What group do you belong to in Judaism? It's not because there's difference. Matter. I'm, it does. It does. No, no, not on this point. Not on this point. Not on this point. On some many points, I can tell you great many points that are different between Chabad. Hold on one second. There's someone at my door. The, Hold on. I got. I get answered. Sure. I'll be right back. Sure. 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 Anybody listening? I want to explain. So first thing I'll tell y'all. So I'm a convert, obviously, right? But in general, if you see a black guy who's not Ethiopian and he's Jewish, he's probably a convert. Now, what does a convert mean? So in the Torah, it says a convert who converts, which means really it's about the soul. Someone who converted is already Jewish. They already have a Jewish soul because in order to understand, to want to do the mitzvahs as a given, you have to already have a Jewish soul. You have to already connect to that spirituality, right? It's not an ethnicity. It's not a bloodline. And that's a big mistake a lot of people make. It's not a bloodline. It has nothing to do with blood. That's why Abraham can marry Hagar have Ishmael as a son, but Ishmael, he's not of the inheritance. He's not of his, he's not of his descent. He has his own direction, his own spiritual direction. That's why you can have, yeah, you can have Esau and you can have Jacob. And Asaph and Jacob are twins, but Asaph does not have the same destiny because he had a different soul. And you can go on down the line. Why did the 10 tribes go off? Because they had a different spiritual destiny, yes. Mm -hmm. It's called door for door. There's a concept in the Torah that talks about door and door, your generation. And when you talk about, when you, when you see Noah, it says Toldos, Todos Noah, and it, just, it gives Noah's generation, right? And it sounds like this is a, a bloodline, a descent, but that's not what's going on. And then, at least not according to us. People can disagree. And then you talk about Todos. It talks about Todos Yaakov. I'm back. Uh, what did I miss? Hello. Just I was bringing up about how Jews understand this whole thing where many people understand it as a bloodline. That's not how Jews understand it. And that's why Ruth can be the grandmother of King David. And yet he's not corrupted that his grandmother is a Moabitess because it has nothing to do with blood. That's not a concept that exists in the Torah. It's not about blood. And people say seed, and old seed only comes from the father. I don't want to get off the subject, but in the Torah, seed does not only come from the father. You have you have uh, verses where it talks about the seed of Hagar. So seed doesn't only come seed. We think seed means semen, but that's not what it means in the Torah. Seed it, just means. It does if you want to say that you are from a tribe of this and a tribe of that, a nation of this. It does. Only the tribe. Yes, right. that's true. But only a tribe, not not so necessarily. What tribe do you belong to? Doesn't matter. We, so today we don't maintain that. That whole thing. Why? So you, I'm just teaching what Judaism teaches. You can disagree, of course. You obviously disagree. So I'm just telling you what Judaism teaches. Mainstream. I mean, Judaism, but you say what Judaism? Not Chabad. Mainstream Judaism. Chabad is not mainstream Judaism. There are things that are different by Chabad. There are things that's different by Litvish. I'm sure you heard these terms, Litvish, by Hasidim, by different type of Hasidim. So who decides you know, like who's Satmar, mainstream? Because mainstream Chabad, is, means, Chabad is very mainstream. No, listen. Mainstream means what most people believe versus what a fringe, different fringe sex believe. Just like in normal times, what's Chabad mainstream would not versus what? considered a fringe. I didn't like, say mainstream wasn't. Anybody in the land of Israel. I didn't, I, didn't say, I, didn't say, I didn't say Chabad wasn't mainstream. I'm saying that mainstream means what most people believe, whether they're Chabad, whether they're Satmar, whether they're Litvish, whether they're modern Orthodox. If they're orthodox. All right. Would you agree with me, though, all right, that what I just said does exist within Judaism? They may not be what you consider mainstream. Which one? Which one? That Judaism is traced through the bloodline of the female. No. There all is right. no idea of bloodline in Judaism. Anywhere in Judaism. It's not about not blood. Taught. That's not it's taught not anywhere blood. in Judaism. I, the word bloodline does not translate to any Hebrew word. 
it's a Goisha concept, meaning it's not a Jewish concept. It's a, it's yes, there's door to door, generation to generation, but it's about not only physical, but the soul. I, I it's not you, necessarily. I'm, I'm, I didn't get so an saying, answer to my question. I hear you. I, understand, I agree with you, but I'm not getting an answer. You might be able to fit that to a scripture. You might be able to bring a scripture and say, this means bloodline. But I'm saying this concept is not how Jews understand it. That's all I'm right, saying. Right, but I'm asking you, would you agree that not all Jews agree what you just said? Uh, no, I would say most Jews, to not my all. knowledge, all Jews. I won't say all Jews because you can find an exception. You can always find an exception. But right. the way Judaism let's just, teaches... Let's just leave it at that because you're saying not, that all Jews agree with you as if I've never heard... This if you are a up. Orthodox Jew, you don't believe in the bloodline, the idea of bloodline. You believe door to door there is a spiritual and physical component. It's physical, yes, it's through the mother, but it's also spiritual. That's why you I, can have somebody... I, I'm, this, not, I'm, just I'm not disagreeing with you. What I'm saying to you, you're, selling, you're telling me that there is no one in Judaism that agrees with me. No one. I'm saying it's not a Jewish concept. They All might right. have that as their own idea, but that's not something Judaism teaches. All right. Well, I've sat on the many There's rabbis. There's no source for that. I've sat on the many rabbis. Even, even here in the Philippines, we have a rabbi that's a close friend of mine. I talk to him all the time. We talk in Hebrew all the time. I'm just, I'm just going to tell you that that's not true, what you're saying, but I understand no. why you're saying it. It's not true. I don't agree with that. That's not, no. Have, let, me, let me hear it. Let me hear the conversation because until I hear it, I don't believe it. How because, can I let you hear a conversation that we had? What do you mean, how let you hear it? Look, Are you, gonna you come say here? one thing, I say another. Look, you say one thing, I say another. So whatever. Have you, have you mean, been you, to Israel? You, you, let's say I've never been to Israel. What would that change about with Judaism teachers? Because it, it, would, it would make a difference if you actually talk to people. In Why? The Why? Because then you'd, have an, then you'd have an idea of what the majority thinks. You'd have a better idea as opposed to reading about it or hearing it about it. I don't need to take a poll of Jews. No, you but know, just talking to people on the street, in the synagogue, in the so school. So how does that change? How does it change with Jews and teachers? Doesn't. No, we're talking about you said perception. What most Jews believe. And what I'm asking Judaism you, teaches. What I'm, Judaism teaches. Right. But you're I'm talking saying. about perception. What most Jews believe. No, I didn't bring. I just. I don't believe I said perception. If I did, I misspoke. When I'm you saying what, what most Jews believe. That, talking about your perception, because I beliefs. Asked you, I'm you talking. Talk I'm not talking about personal belief. I'm talking about what Judaism teaches as a religion. What do Jews believe? That's right. this, what would you learn in yeshiva? If you go to yeshiva, I have. Have you, you learn, been to yeshiva? If let's say I had it, what does that change anything? Let's say let's say I did it. I'm just saying, how does that change it? It doesn't what, change it. What? Okay, well, show me in the tractate in Talmud or in Mishnah. If you or don't trust anywhere, if you don't you trust what I'm saying, what? We can do that, have a common conversation, but it's a much longer conversation. That's hours long conversation around sources. Right now, I'm just trying to understand what you think. And maybe you're trying to understand what I think, or maybe you're not. But that's a much longer conversation. Uh, just let me sources. clarify. I'm not attacking you. If I were to attack you, I'd be... I'm not taking this as an attack. I'm not taking this as an attack. I'm just saying. I was just trying to get an, saying, an idea much, of where you're coming from. You took it as an attack. This is mainstream Judaism. This is what any rabbi would say. You say different. Okay. That's what you say. All right. Uh, yeah, that's not what every rabbi would say, but I agree with you. I, that would, it's not I would say shared if, across all rabbis in all of Judaism. Judaism is not just one mo monolithic thing. It is. There's different, it there's really different is. sects. There's the, different the views traditions. on certain core doctrine is very narrow. Very narrow. Certain things you can you can you can, the Kabbalah and different things and you can pray, you know, Ashkenaz versus Sephard and Nusak Ari, you can change the certain things. But certain core things, this is you, this is your strike, and you're outside of your strike. Your strike, right. Judaism. Now you can disagree, okay? You can disagree. That's right, okay. Shalom. We believe. Shalom, that, I got a shalom. few questions. Let me uh, let me. So, we believe that um, Yiddish kite and what uh, what is taught in Judaism today is what the man of this book that you're asking about attacked, like to the core. He said, "Don't even don't even bother listening to that. Reject that." And that's why you would have rabbis in the Middle Ages and whatnot attack this book in Hebrew. Because he was not a fan of Yiddishkeit. He was not a fan of Judaism. He was not. He was an enemy, an adversary of it, just like he was an adversary of the Christian church. That's why they would attack this book. Yeah, he was a normal guy. Yeah, he, he lived and died. You know, he was not divine, but he was no friend of Yiddishkeit. He was no friend of the Christian church. Yeah, that's why they would attack him in this book. Getting back to our point where we, got, we, where we left off.
Can I can I speak to that real quick? I haven't, like I said, you you got me at a disadvantage, and I want to thank you for sharing this with me. I would have to see that Jews are writing things against this book. Is there any such, you know, yeah, polemics you get, against? You can get you can get the Evan Bohan by Shem Tov. So you can read Hebrew. It's Middle Eastern Hebrew. You have to be able to read Middle Eastern Hebrew, and he in that yeah, book sure. attacks it. Evan Bohan. Now you said Shem Tov is the one who came out with the with the text, no? Shem Tov reproduced it. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't come out. Why would he it. reproduce something in order just to attack it if nobody even heard of it? Why not just burn it? Because, like I said, this this book was a problem, not the New Testament. But if you, book. if I'm a Jew, and I have this secret text, you should read it now, instead of asking me. Because I, I can I can tell okay. you I can tell you why, okay. but until you see it for yourself, you know what I mean. It's just me telling you. If you get his book okay. Evan Bohan and read it, he tells you why he attacks okay. the book. He tells you why okay. he has a problem with this and why he has a problem with that and why he's he, he, and he also tells you uh, the context of the of the history of that time. And there's nowhere in there in any of his writings, and all of them, all of them are polemic. He's, he's defending Judaism. He's attacking different beliefs that are coming against Judaism. He never attacks the Greek New Testament. He didn't even bother attacking the Greek New Testament because it, they knew that was BS. It was a waste of time to even bother trying to go through that. But this one he did attack. Okay. Can't so, argue with that. Uh, you should read I hear that. you saying. Yeah, you should read that because like, I, will. I, I can tell you. you should, so I, will. I can tell you what I've gotten from it. But until you read it, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's going to hit different. So I'll tell you about me real quick. I'll tell you about me because, like I said, I'm not trying to have a hostile thing here. I just felt like in that moment, you're questioning, you know, you know, but ultimately at the end of the day, either you believe what I'm saying or you're not, or you don't. That's what it comes down to. If you don't believe what I'm saying, that's your own choice. Or you think, oh, he's, you know, he's black. He's, uh, he's in a racist society. I'm just imagining. I, I, he's, he's lying to himself. You can believe that too. You're going to believe what you believe. So instead of trying to control that, I'm just going to acknowledge that. I'm going to tell you a bit about me. Long story short, I grew up as a I, – I, first, my family went through every single type of movement you can imagine as a kid, as a young kid. We were – and then a why. We were uh, – sorry, said society. Excuse me. got to blow my nose. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Sorry about that. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so anyway, long story short, we went to Sarset Society, which is the Kematics. We went through, like, every type of black identity movement. We went through, we were conscious, uh, conscious Afrocentrics. Um, I went to an Afrocentric private school uh, most of my childhood. And then eventually we ended up in, um, in uh, African Hebrews Lights of Jerusalem. Have you ever heard of them? In Demona? Okay, Robbie Benami. Yeah, in Demona. Robbie Benami. Yep. So that's the group that I grew up in most of my childhood. So, yes, I went to Demona when I was 16. Yes, I went back to Israel when I was in my 20s. And I'm actually about to go back there um, in like a couple weeks. But did I ever live there? No. Am I fluent in Hebrew? No. You had me at a disadvantage. But I'm just telling you, honestly. So at some point, really when I was about 18, I always felt like, um, African Hebrews Lights was making stuff up. Um, I'll tell you a quick, 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 quick story. Very quick story that really made me, it kind of crystallized my childhood. So we were celebrating Passover. And we celebrated this one day, not two days like the Jews. We celebrated one day. And anyway, they made a new law that we're not going to flush the toilet on Passover. Now, we believe in communal housing. So we had maybe, let's say, five families in one house. Now, so maybe there's two bathrooms. So you can imagine after 24 hours of the no one flushing the toilet, how disgusting the bathroom was, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, that I, it stuck in my mind because I'm a kid. You can't flush the toilet, right? It's, it's like, what is going on? But whatever. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm obedient. I'm a good kid. I did what my parents told me to do. So yeah. I said, okay. So then the next year, uh, no other holy day did we ever bring back that law. And that was just an example of the arbitrariness of the leadership. That yeah. one moment we have this very important law we must follow and yeah. through much hardship. And then the next moment that law is gone. So right. it just made me see they're making stuff up. And then too, as I got older, I started to see there's no so sort of codified law. There's no book I can open 
and read the laws. The mm. other problem was I spent all my childhood. I was a I was an inside kid because my parents wouldn't let me uh, engage. I went to a public high school later on, uh, but they wouldn't let me be normal. They wouldn't let me like you know what I'm saying stay after school, go over people's house and stuff like that. So I spent a lot of time with the community and reading my Bible a lot. I was very religious kid, very religious. Don't get me wrong. I had a girlfriend. I snuck out and stuff like that. But mostly I did what my parents said. Mostly I did what my parents said. Long story short, um, I started seeing the holes that a lot of these things you can't just do by reading the Bible. For instance, um, sitsis, you know, the sitsis, right? So tt in modern, in modern Hebrew, tt. So you can't, you can't read, put fringes on the corner of a four corner garment and figure out how to make the sitsis. How long is it? What is it exactly? Is it? A button is it now we know okay sits miss sits me look upon you know you know you can you can find hits but it doesn't really tell you how to do it and so that's how it is with all the mitzvahs it doesn't it's not very clear which ones are mitzvahs for all time which ones are only for a certain time um how do you do these and then when i started to learn at that time we were already converting to judaism because of status in the land you know the problems many problems in the land right with the head with the african hebrews lights mm -hmm. so most of them don't have citizenship uh, they have residency at best. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come there later as an older adult, it's like really hard for you. So uh -huh. we were trying to figure out a way around that, right? So the way we did was we convert to reform our conservative Judaism. So I was already familiar somewhat. I started already started being familiar with Judaism in some respects. So as I got older, I said, I'm going to be an Orthodox Jew. I said, I'm gonna, I want to learn about it anyway. It started with just reading books. And then as I grew and grew and grew, I'm getting to the end of the story. But you want to know about me? So this is basically telling you what happened. So this was, I was about 20, 22, 23, maybe a little younger when I went, really, I started when I was 18, really reading, but it, it was by the time I was in my early 20s, I'm like, all right, I'm really going to do this. And so I, I went through the process. You know, it's very difficult to convert. Um, pretty much you got to move to a community. There's only a few communities that will convert you. Um, mm -hmm. And then you got to really do all these laws and you don't have your support system. You don't have yeah. the family because usually Jews have big families. You don't have a, your family with you. Usually your family's against you. Long story short, I went through the whole process, got through the process of many years. Very difficult. Um, it's not that they make it difficult. It's just a difficult process. It's like moving to another country uh, with no help. Long story short, um, trying to get to the point now. So anyway, that's pretty much me. So I, I, I'm still in the community. I still um, really right now, my life is all about Jews. I, I work with Jews. Um, I live, I, I'm in the show with Jews. You know, Brooklyn Sherman, I found a wife. Um, I'm married. We have a, a daughter. So that's my life. And Judaism is my whole life. Um, and it was a hard struggle to get here because I really doubted myself the whole time. Like, do I really need to do this? Is this really the right thing? You know, is this really necessary? I really didn't want to do it. I really did not want to convert. I really didn't want to convert because um, it's very difficult to live an Orthodox life if you didn't grow up that way. Let's put it well, like that. I've been where you are, except the part where you converted. I didn't need to convert. My mother is Jewish. So I was technically, like I said earlier, born Jewish, even though we weren't religious. So when I made Aliyah in 2006, I didn't need to convert. But I spent a lot of time in the south in Des Moines. I spent, you know, I went down there and spent many days with them. I lived in, uh, I lived all over the country. I lived in Renan. I lived in Modin. I lived in Jerusalem. I lived in Tel Aviv. My, right now, my apartment's in Tel Aviv. Um, so I've been, you know, I was, I was where you were. I mean, I was very religious, very, 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 very strict in my halakha and, and trying to observe. Like I said, as I got older, I wanted to become more and more uh, observant. And then I moved to Israel to sort of solidify that. So but, um, so can you tell me a little bit about your Yiddish type? You know, were you Sephardic, Ashkenazi, Menhagin, Ashkenazi. with Tamani, Ashkenazi? So, so what, 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 uh, like, what new stuff did you dive in? Like, just tell me a little bit about your religious, what religiousness you held at that time, and what was um, it like? Our, just a little our bit. shul in the United States, we were part of a conservative shul, Masorti, and mm -hmm. so we just dove in basically Ashkenazi, and then I got more zealous and I joined Chabad. And I was part of. Mm -hmm. I, I was part of Chabad mm -hmm. up until I moved here. Um, mm -hmm. very, to Israel or, or to Philippines. I was I was Chabad in, in the U.S. And then when I moved to Israel, I was still Chabad, 
And then when I came okay. here, I was Chabad. I was Chabad all the way through. And like I said, I still okay, have my, okay. still have my uh, contacts with the rabbi here, and I still visit him. He's a good friend of mine, and we still talk. Um, so you went like full beard? What'd you do? You had like the whole beard? You had the whole thing with the whole like black and white? You did it like, or was it more no, like friend of Chabad? I, more friend of Chabad? I, yeah, I didn't do the whole black hat and all that, but I was... Like, friend of Kabad, friend of Kabad, but you dive in New Sakari, I'm guessing, New Sakari and all that. Yeah. Like, how crazy were for you for the for the Rebbe? You had a picture of the Rebbe on your wall? Like, how crazy were you about it? No, I knew, I mean, I, I remember the Rebbe, I don't know how old you are, but I remember him when he was when he was here. Um, right, right. Was making yeah. those predictions, but I never saw him as the Messiah. I never, I never but did you have a picture that. on the wall and stuff? Yeah, like, the no. yellow flag came later. No, no, no. I didn't have it. I, you know, Schneer sent to me was just a man, and when he died, I knew that he was going to stay dead. <laughs> uh, so you wasn't all, you wasn't sold out for Chabad. You was more like a friend of Chabad. No, there's different. See, I'm telling you, even in, in Chabad, there's differences. Not everyone in Chabad believed he was the Messiah. Right, but even the people who wasn't, even here in the Philippines, we have a, him, in though. the Philippines, we have, yeah. there's a movement here in the Philippines, which is trying to isolate, or it's like a witch hunt. They're trying to identify everyone who thinks he's the Messiah. They put them on a blacklist. Yeah, Mexicans. Like they, yeah, yeah, Mexicans. Yeah. yeah, that's that's happening even here. And there's there's infighting even here amongst amongst the Chabad to try to expel yeah. them, expel everyone who thinks he's the Messiah. He's still coming back. He's yeah. going to be resurrected and all that. There's a movement here in the Philippines among the among the rabbinic to expel any Chabadnik who believes that. Get them out. Yeah, the yellow flag, the yellow flag wavers. But I'm saying, even yeah. even so the ones was, that are not I yellow was, flag guys. I was not believing he was the Messiah. I mean, I looked up to him obviously. <laughs> But I did not see him as I knew when he died he was not coming back. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But, but and even I, the I ones that, him on my wall. Yeah. Even the ones that's not that didn't believe the Messiah, they still was like totally sold out for him. You know what I'm saying? Like they was crazy for him. Like even the ones that like anyway, okay, let's move on. So I guess what I could ask you is like what did you find unfulfilling about Yiddish guy? Right? Like why did you decide to go in a whole different direction like you did? For me it was the name. For me, I didn't uh, even when even when I was a child, the fact that we are taught that his name is not to be pronounced, you know, except for once a year by the Kohen Hagadol, didn't 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 make any sense to me because all throughout the scriptures and the prophets, we see people uttering his name over and over again in praise and so forth. So that always stuck in my brain that this is a man-made rule. Someone made up this rule that his his name is not to be pronounced except by such and such and blah blah blah. And so I began to search for that name. I began to search really how that name is pronounced. When did it become taboo to say it? All that, all the history around the, the name. And I had those answers, those questions even before I left the country, even before I left the U.S. I went to Israel to try to find those answers. Didn't find them. And then when I came here in the Philippines, I found them. I found my answers. And then I had to, you know, it took me a few years to shed off. I had to unlearn and go through a whole process. Like I said, I was very orthodox. I had to go through a process of, you know, undoing all that and unlearning all that. Why? Well, why? Not, why? Why, why give teach, us the fill in? If I'm going to, why give us the fill in? And you go ahead. I haven't given up that. Just the way they do it. But in order for me to teach someone how to pronounce that name, according to Judaism, right? I bought myself a one-way ticket to <laughs> show. Off. That's uh, not true. That's not true, though. So. All right, I'm do you just say saying what do I you, do. You say I'm his saying, name in prayer and regular conversation. So the first thing is that, according to Judaism, and obviously you, like you said, it sounds like you grew up. You're in this movement. You're around this movement. So you might, you obviously have your own opinions. But I'll teach you what I, the way I understand it, and the way I know it, and what I believe being a part of the Jewish community. There's not one name of Shem. There's over a hundred names of Shem in Tyre, right? And the UK K is only one name. It's not, it's not like this, this, they all like a ship can't be contained in a name. Ship can't be contained in one name. And we, we also have other names that we added like Hakadosh Baruch Hu and the Abister and so on and so forth, you know, so. Well, according to me, like I said, I, I became fluent in language so that I would not have to listen to, you know, people's opinions. I could read these documents for myself and that would just. Yeah, but. Is not not really true. Even the language is set up the way wait, the language is wait, structured. Wait, what do you mean? What's not true? What's not true? That he has more than one name. No, he has over a hundred names. Are you talking about Kel Kel Yon, Kel Shaddai, Elohim? Okay, well, those are titles that describe his power. No. So why is what's the difference? What's the difference between a name and a title? 
Because in, name the is language, the title. in the language, right, we have a thing called the accusative object marker. I don't know if you know what that is. The accusative object what? marker. But S? But S? Okay, you're going to say Which but one? S. But that accusative Which object. Which one? You just said it. Sorry. I don't but mean S. to. I'm, listening. I'm going to listen to you. Sorry. Okay, relax. <laughs> Slow down. I'm listening to you. I'm sorry. You, you, got, me hot. That... you got me excited. I mean, I'm yeah, feeling, right, feeling well, a lot of energy down, from you. I'm feeling down. energy from you. I'm listening. Yeah. The, the, the accusative object marker is always going to be placed before a proper noun, a definite proper noun. It is not placed before a title, a general description. Okay? So whenever you go through the scriptures and you read the language and you become fluent in the language, you will see that the four-lettered name is always prefixed, right? When it's, whenever it's being used in a verb, or some act is being attributed to him, it's always going to have the accusative object marker before that name. But the titles do not have it because they are not proper nouns. They are not proper okay. names. Okay. So the language itself so is say telling you, the language of biblical Hebrew is telling you that this is his only proper name. Everything else. So you're saying, but S should always be in front of you, okay, okay. Not always, but when, it's, when, when you're talking about him, when, when the, when uh, when verbs are used, right? When he's being described in, in some act, right? Or when you when you when, when there is an imperative verb telling you to do something to him, like praise him, thank him, worship him. Okay, you will always find the accusative there. Not when it, not when you're using titles, Elohim, okay, El Shaddai. All those titles do not use the accusative because they are not proper nouns in the language. The language itself is telling you that this is his only proper name. So you're telling me that if I look in the Tyra, the S is used before the YK Vav K at times, but never in front of Elohim or Kel Koyon or Kel Shaddai or Kel Shavadot or any other of these type of names of Hashem. That's what, that's the damn understanding that, is that true? No, that's true. Look at the word. Okay. For you to say halal ya, halal ya. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to say it in my dialect. No, please do. Please do. I, that's totally But fine. if you look at that word, you know, in modern in modern language, it's hallelujah. Okay. Right, hallelujah. Yeah. There's no accusative in that. It's just halal and then the two letter, two the, the abbreviation or the, or the diminutive form of the divine name, ya or yud and hey. But when you look at the full, when, it's, when, it's, when the four-lettered name is used, the halal is interrupted by the accusative object marker. Always, 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 always. The S Hashem. You should always say, you're saying also, you should always say the S Hashem. The S, you came up with. Exactly. When you have, an, a, when you have an imperative verb or any finite verb that's describing him, right, or, you're being, or your, direct, your attention is being directed, or, or if he's describing himself and that proper name is used, you will find the accusative object marker, but never will you find it used for a title. So the orthography, mm. the orthography, the, the morphology of the language tells you that this is different. This, this is not the same as these other names. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. I mean, I've never heard that before and uh, very interesting, very, very interesting. But I don't want to say get you're off, very you know, wise man. Very wise wanna... man. Clearly, you're a very wise man. I mean, I never yeah, doubted according that. According to you, I'm a belligerent, angry, the most angriest man you've ever met. <laughs> That's been my experience with you. Yes. That's been That's my true. experience with you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring <laughs> out just one verse and you tell me, um, you tell me. I just want to bring one verse. I know if we get too hard into it, I just want you to explain this one verse to me because S not being in front of a title, right? And tell me why I'm misunderstanding this. So it's Joshua 24, 14. I'm just 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 trying to just to why we're still on this point. I'm not gonna push the push it too hard. I just this one verse. I'm just curious how you would address this verse. Okay. Joshua 24, 14. It's in the Tanakh. I know which sometimes verses are different. I'm looking at it right now. Which part am I looking at? Um, so you says your U S Hashem, right? So it no. says S Hashem, like we said, right? Okay. Yeah, it's how you're S Hashem, right? And then you yeah. go down, it says S Elohim. Mm. So it says, put away the gods that your forefathers served beyond their face. So in that case, you're right. So I really need to go inside this point 
that's a really good point I never noticed. You're right. This is talking about idols, not the name of a show. So you you got a good point. All right, let's move on. You're right, though. I think you're right. I have to really think on that. Hmm. That's a good point. I can't argue with that. Okay. Do some research and uh, let me know. Like, That's a good point. Let me ask you a different question. Uh, and thank you for your time. I know we've been talking for a while now. Um, thank you for your time. I'm going to ask you a question. This is my biggest question. I have two big questions, really three big questions. Number one, why do you reject the Masoretic text? I don't reject the Masoretic text. Who was telling you this stuff? Well, the 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 vocalization system, right? All right, I reject that. Of the books that produce, like the, the sun, the, the Masoretic text is the vocalization system, right? There's no, other, not, there's other not. texts. The, the, the Masoretic text is witnessed before the Nakud was introduced. The Masoretic text, the, what makes the Masoretic text significant is the vocalization. That's what makes, that's what, that's the Masoretic text is the vocalization system. But the text, the actual wording of the text is witnessed before. The vocalization is the text. No, no, listen to me. Calm down. Relax. I'm talking about the wording of the text. Like if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and you compare those scrolls with the Masoretic text, they are, you know, for the most part, identical. But there is no Nakud in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is Nakud in the right. Masoretic text, but not the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. So that's what I'm, that's well, what some I'm of saying. the texts, some of the texts, I believe Isaiah, I believe Isaiah has, has Nakudus, but... No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. All right. So I don't but, um, reject the I'm Masoretic not gonna text. I reject the vocalization. The vocalization, the without the vocalization, the Masoretic text cannot be understood. How did? How was it understood before there was the coup? Like I said, because the people don't have still, it. because people, a lot of people still knew Hebrew, or you could say Gabriel, whatever term you want to they use. They didn't know it. They didn't know it by relying upon the coup, though. That's my point. They didn't have to because they knew it. Just like. Just like, you know. So why was it necessary to introduce Nakud all of a sudden? Because already by the year 500 CE, right, Aramaic was the main, was started to be, or was the main spoken language, right? So by the time, so you still have about a thousand years, really not thousand years, 1500 years between, um, really the ninth century, right? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. So you're talking about from 500 CE to the ninth century, so you're talking about somewhere around 1400 years. That's how long it was between most people speaking Aramaic and, and introducing. It's because it, it, it had went because of the gal, because of Galut, Gullus, right? Well, Dispersing of I don't agree with 500 BC as the start of Aramaic becoming the predominant. Why? Language why not? Because people. because why was the Book of Daniel in Aramaic? Then? It's only two chapters of that book that are in Aramaic, not the whole book. Right, but to have any Aramaic, why? Because you know, he was a wasn't captive, a he, was a, he was a captive, and he had to work for the king. And some of that stuff he did, right. he had to make, he had to translate for the king. He couldn't just write everything in his own okay. language. Same okay. thing with Ezra. Ezra was Ezra was a, uh, an employee of the Persian government. So, so why did he have to write the book in Aramaic? Though? He didn't write the book. He only wrote two chapters. This, Daniel's I'm saying, twelve chapters. Okay, so that's like what, like one sixth of the book is in Aramaic. Why? I just why? told you why, because like I said, he was an employee of the government and he had to translate a lot of his things for Aramaic, especially chapter but, two, but, he's speaking to the king, he's speaking to the king and telling the okay. his dream, he has to speak in Aramaic, how the hell the, the king's going to say what he's saying? But why not just write in the Hebrew? Why write in the Aramaic at all? You know, that's what, I guess my question is. This that's more authentic. Is for... he's, he, he was asked to interpret the king's dream. Okay. Right? He's not going to tell the king okay. his dream in, in Hebrew going to tell it in Aramaic and he recorded it in Aramaic because this is this actually happened. I know some people don't believe this book. They think it's you know was written in the second century, way after the Maccabee Maccabean Revolution. That's not true. At least mm -hmm. I don't believe that's true. So I believe the book okay. of Daniel is, is authentic and he's writing what he did. In the second year of Nabo Khadar Nazar, he wrote or he interpreted the king's dream and he told him the dream in that king's language, which was Aramaic. Okay. No big deal. So for you're us. saying Okay, we can fine. See, we, I mean, can see that, Aramaic, we can see our make all the way back. Jews don't back. disagree with any of that. Just agrees don't agree, don't agree with don't but disagree. But that doesn't mean with, that like, doesn't mean Aramaic became the said. only or the predominant spoken language. Not language. only, not only, but we simply adapted and we included that language. We know how to speak it now. But when we're amongst each other, we're not speaking Aramaic. Why would we? So you're saying so you're saying that after the Gullus of uh Assyrian, not the Assyrian Gullus, the Babylonian Gullus, 
you're saying that already they did not have a common discourse in Aramaic. It was they so could, easy. they could, but they, they wouldn't need to do that amongst themselves. They could talk to other people in Aramaic fluently, but why would they do that amongst themselves? Why would they, dis why would they despair as their own national language to adopt the Hebrew? Well, because, because already by, you know, the first century, we know that we had the Targutum, right? We had the Aramaic translations because a lot of people already at that time, so we're talking about they were around converts. the time of... The, 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 by that time... Oh, have... that's, how you, that's how you say that, they're converts. Oh, yeah. Why would people massive, Why would people massively convert to a religion that is under attack and just the temple was just destroyed? No, 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 Rome I'm talking just... about even before the temple was destroyed. Okay, like, like I said, if you... Why? Like, you well, why would... Shore, it talks about how... Judaism today is not a religion that actively proselytizes, but it used to be. And then before the destruction of the Second Temple, it used to be a religion that heavily proselytized. And that was one of the things that the, you know, the man of this book, the Matthew that I'm talking about, he condemned. He condemned that because they were making these proselytes from these different nations. And they were allowing these people to come in and introduce, you know, other stuff into the mix. So you're saying, you're saying that the Targunim were made because there were so many converts that they need these start going for them. Well, That's it's, what you're it's saying. the same thing about the LXX. The Septuagint was not made because we suddenly didn't know how to speak Hebrew. It was made because converts didn't know how to speak Hebrew. That, that doesn't match. Made. I mean, that doesn't match with any of the scholars. But I could, you could agree with that. But like, who's what uh, scholars you, support that? If, it was a it was I the think, Greek it was the Greek community scholars. of Alexand it was the Greek community of Alexandria. But if you they lived in a Greek, the, they were Hellenized Jews. Okay, Hellenized what I'm trying Jews. to say that if you read the LXX. And I'm not talking about just cursively, but you actually read it really detailed. You will see that there's mistranslations of Hebrew words. Basic Hebrew words are mistranslated in the LXX. That tells me that the people translating it, Hebrew was not their native tongue. It was something they adopted. And that's well, not just my opinion. You... That's okay. not my opinion. That's the, that's the opinion of scholars who have looked at the LXX thoroughly, thoroughly. And they said the tradition mm -hmm. that says this was made because the king uh, told me the second wanted a translation to put in his, in his library is not true. That's a myth. That comes from the letter of Aristides that tries to justify this translation that all these rabbis, 72 rabbis got together. They sat down in a room, in separate rooms so they couldn't see each other and they all made a translation and they all, all their translations read word for word. That's a myth. It didn't happen that way. This translation was made because there was a, com a community of Jews, mostly converts in Alexandria who wanted to translate and they could read. They could not read the Hebrew. That was not their language. What, they could, they what's could your evidence speak that they were Hebrew? But the what's translation your evidence they are mostly converts? My evidence is that the translation that they made, when you look at it detailedly, word for word, really examine it, you'll see that there are misunderstandings of Hebrew in that translation. And some of them are, are, blare, are glaring mistranslations of Hebrew. Some of them are geographical, where they got mistakes wrong about geography which tells me that these people weren't even familiar with the land that the Bible describes. Okay, you got to really, you got to really study this stuff. Is it, right? is it possible, is it possible, I mean, have you taken into account the uh, Samaritan text, that the Samaritan text and the Septuagint match in a lot of details? It's different yeah, from the Masoretic. I, I, see, this is what you have probably so, haven't heard about but me. The, I, don't reject, but the, I don't reject these I'm just asking witnesses. questions. I'm just asking questions. I, I, I use all these witnesses, the Masoretic text, I use that as a witness, the Samaritan Pentateuch, I use that as a witness, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the LXX, I use all these witnesses. I don't dismiss them, I simply compare them, right? And I, I take from them what, what you know, has the most attestation going for it in terms of where they differ in their readings. But I don't say I'm just, I'm just saying, the, the Masoretic yeah. text, don't, that's not what we do. No, I'm just saying, I'm just saying like in the, those details, Many of those details match up with the Samaritan text, and the Samaritans never left the land. The Samaritans also didn't accept converts. No, no, no. The one that to I'm, my understanding, the they never about, accepted converts. The one I'm talking the about. LXX. The LXX. The, the, the problems where I'm talking about are not aren't evident in the Samaritan Pentateuch. For example, let me give you an example. Okay. Um, if you okay. turn to, uh, let me see if I can. Pull real quick, so I'm not missing. No, I appreciate that, and I appreciate your time. Like I said, and if you have to go, like I understand, like this is like this is really good. So no, I'm, I'm go, good. I, I, just, I, I just, appreciate uh, it. Hold on, appreciate your time. But no, this is good. This is giving me some really good stuff to, to chew on.
really good stuff. It's, uh, you for you with Bereshit, chapter 20, verse 13. 2014. Okay. 20 I'm looking at, 13. I got a Septuagint right here. You said 2014? Verse 20, verse 13, where it okay. says, And it came to pass, God caused me to wander. Okay. In the Masoretic okay. text, the verb there, tha or ta ayin in hey, right? That verb is put in the third person plural, which means it has to agree with the noun that comes after it, Elohim. So this, okay. the Masoretic text is actually saying that Abram believed in more than one God. He, he worships several gods. He says, God's plural caused me to wander from my father's house. You don't see that in the LXX. You don't see that in the Samaritan Pentateuch. That but verb wait. is in the singular, not the plural. Wait, so you're saying because the Hebrew said gods and the no, 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 said not, the, God? not the noun, not the noun, the verb, the verb before the noun. But the verb and the, and the noun have to match. If you translate it as God, don't yeah, you have to it, translate exactly. the verb? Exactly. What what is the verb? What person? What number is that verb? I'm trying to pull it up right now, but you're saying they don't match. Is that what you're I'm saying? I'm saying they do match, but it's teaching you that Abram worshiped several gods and he's, he's attributing several gods as to why he moved into the land of Canaan. Okay. So, you know what my explanation for that would be? No, but have you found the verb? I want you to look at the verb. Okay. I'm with you. Um, It's going to be in the causative stem. Pisu. Causative Pisu. stem. Pisu. Pisu. yeah. Okay, that's third Pisu. person. That's third person common plural. Cause, common plural. Plural. That means the noun okay. Elohim has to be plural, not singular noun. Now that has to be a plural noun. Okay. So the Masoretic text okay, is telling you that Abram is saying that God's plural caused me to wander from my father's house. But I don't know. I don't know if I accept that. Well, you, I'll tell you why not, I don't accept that. It's not up for debate. That's the language. That's the actual verb. It's I'll tell form. you why I don't accept. I don't, but that's more of that's exegesis. That's no, interpretation. No, it's not. That's, that's, tell not you, that's grammar. I'll tell that's you why. Grammar. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because when you read Rashid Barah el it also says el Akim. Rashid Barah el Akim. I'm not talking about Harvest, the noun. Right? I'm not talking about the noun. I'm talking about you're that You're talking word. about the, you're talking about, you're talking about, you're talking about the verb. I get the you. Verb. I get what you're saying. And you're bringing up a good point. But I'm saying the way that, like, even if you look into an English translation of this verse, especially a the JPS English translation, it's going to say God. Verb. The English translation but, ignores but, the verb. But you see what I'm, you see what I'm saying? It's exegesis. No, it's not. This is grammar. This is what I'm talking about. This is grammar. It's the Septuagint, exegesis. The Septuagint yeah. and the Samaritan Pentateuch have that verb, same verb, in the singular, not the plural. The Septuagint uh, I gotta see. I gotta and the Samaritan Pentateuch have that verb in the singular. They disagree with the Masoretic text here. Let's, let me see. Let me see. I think you might be. I mean, you may be right. I mean, so far, you've been right so far. I can't argue with you, but. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie to you. Quick. I wouldn't lie to you. I wouldn't bring this up. I don't I think you're absolutely certain. I'm certain about this. The grammar is. I don't think the grammar can't be, yeah. you know, it's not about exegesis, any of that stuff right now. It's strictly hard, factual. Yeah, but. Grammar. How you interpret the grammar is exegesis. I'm not interpreting the grammar. I'm just reading it. That verb is plural. Therefore, the noun following it can't be singular. It can't be a singular absolute. It must be plural. He is saying in this verse, if this verb is but, correct, that God's plural but, made him wonder. But but God is infinite. No, right? bro. See, you're 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 trying to interpret the word Elohim now, and we can do that all I day. Mean, but you got the grammar, like you said, the verb with the number has to agree with the noun. Which is the subject of that verb? They have to Basically, agree. we're saying we're talking about the verb, right? That the, yeah, the verb, verb is a plural verb, a plural causative verb. Which Third okay, person, I agree. common plural. But, but the issue is right. So, what is what's the significance of that? Right? You could say, well, we're saying Abraham worshipped many gods. He's or saying, because he's saying that those many the, gods he worshipped is the, the reason that caused him to wander from his father's house and come into the land of Canaan, which we know from other this verses that's not issue. true. Yeah. So this verse is a problem. This verse is contradicting other but, verses. But, but wait a second. But wait a second. Does it? Because it said Lech Lecha, right? He left his father's house, right? Lech Lecha. He left his father's house. Lech right? Lecha means go you. But yeah, I, I get it. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, we understand that. But yeah. look, I'm saying, why does it, how does it contradict? Why does it have to contradict? 
because the grammar is different. You can't okay, have both so ways. You can't have it. You can't have them both be right. One is right and one is wrong. Who says it's more than one God in the Torah? Listen, I'm not agreeing. I'm not saying that I agree that there's more than one God. I know there's only one. But this wording in the Masoretic text is a copious mistake that it, it has to be fixed. I, I don't know. I don't know. Because it doesn't that. agree with the older manuscripts. It doesn't agree with the Samaritan Pentateuch. It what doesn't agree with the LXX. Uh, I just okay. told you the Samaritan Pentateuch and the LXX doesn't agree. Okay. Verb is singular. Uh, I, I hear I agree with I agree that the, the facts of the text. I agree with the text. I just don't know if I agree with the interpretation of that you have of the text. But I, I'm not gonna argue with I you haven't further. I haven't really you offered know. an interpretation. What I just told you what that what, By that, what that verse says. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. What it says, point blank, black and white, okay, God's plural caused me to wander from my father's house. Which is not true. Mm -hmm. It's not true. It wasn't God's plural, it was only one God. That made him wander from his father's house. It says Elohim. It says most of the most of the Genesis narrative says Elohim. So that alone is not enough. Only this verb is really the only thing significant. And we no, already no, know but, that but we Elohim. Know, but we know Elohim is always going to be singular because the verbs that are used to describe it will be singular. Just like in the beginning, okay, first verse of Genesis one. That verb created is singular, not plural. So the noun has to be singular. We know that. The verb is going to dictate whether or not that noun is plural or singular. I don't like know if that's beginning. significant enough to, to reinterpret the whole verse. Basically, you reinterpret the whole verse of what it's traditionally understood based on this one feature of the language. I just find that a little bit... You made a good you, point. I'm not saying... I haven't reinterpreted anything. Bit. I'm simply reading it. That verse, this is so, what it says, not, not me interpreting it. This is what it says. God's plural caused me to wander. That's not me interpreting. That's me reading the text as it is written in the Masoretic text. But, but God is infinite. Okay, you're, you're stuck on the word God. You know what I'm saying? I, I agree that. You know we're saying? not talking about the word God. We're talking about the verb that describes his number. Is it singular or plural? Is he more than one God or is it just one God? Well, this verse... He has this more verb, than one aspect of him. He's right, that's different. That's why he has so verb, many names. This verb right? will be he has, singular. He has, he's God of the breast. He's, you know, what even does... Yudhei yud Vavke, right? Yudhei Vavke is the I, I was, I am, and I will be. That is, no, I'm going to be different... That would be that's ah, what your yeah. okay means. No, no, no. That would be because that's ah, how it should ah, ah, reveal himself to Moses. That's how it should reveal to Moses. That's the first it's a UK part. UK okay is part. a UK is okay is a is a is a abbreviation of that. No, no, it's not. No, you're getting okay. you're getting the root All verbs right. confused. There's a the root verb using the no, root not confused. Verbs. That's what Jesus teaches. I could be wrong. I could be yeah. I, I could be wrong and Jesus could be wrong. You obviously can't. I will be who I will be is not the same thing as this four letter name. It's a different it's a different verb. Completely different verb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's not yeah, yeah in verse 14. It's eh yeah for you. Which one? Eh yeah. Which one? Which one what which which verse are you talking about? Yeah, Ashar, eh yeah. You talking eh about yeah. when the Shem appeared to Moshe? You call that's him Masha? You just said. That's what you just said. You brought up that up. You brought that up where he introduced himself and told him his name. In the beginning, uh -huh. in the first introduction, he said, I will be who I will be. I Ahye. will be who I will be. Ahye. Because, Ahye. because, Ahye. because Moshe Benu, because Moshe Benu would never get to see the full accusation, right, of Hashem's promise. Like, he never would see, he never got to see the land, he never got to see the temple, I know, he never he got to see any of things. All he asked was a simple question, what is your name? Very simple. That was not, there That's was nothing because esoteric. God has... There was nothing esoteric or mystical or, or you know, magical. He just simply because, asked him, what's his name? Because just like, just like if I'm... If I ask right, you your name, you're, gonna, you're not going to tell me all this detail about... I'm not God. Your history, your... But still, he didn't I'm ask God. that. He didn't ask, are you God and how are you God and where do you come from and what makes you God and, you know, where were you before there was this? He didn't ask him all that. He simply asked, simply asked him, what's your name? That's it. What do I go back and tell but these people? But that's what a name, name is. A name is... But he wanted the name so he can go back and tell the people. He said, what should I go but back and tell that. these people? Who is talking to me? What's your name? I'm going to ask you. They're going to ask more. But they're not going to ask yes. him all that. He said the people are going to ask him what's your but name. They, but wouldn't, asking, you, you are, wouldn't, you? Huh? wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't no. you? If you're a slave and you're telling, I'm telling you, hey, I'm going to free you by this God's no, by this I have, God. Like I said, wouldn't as you want to know who this God is? Question, I want to know his name. Just like look, a child. Doesn't what's God, my look, name? You look in the title. But look, check this out. A name in the Hebrew is everything. It's not just a simple thing. It's a quality, right? So, like, God had different names to different different people. He revealed himself one, differently. Like, he has one like, like 
I'll tell you one example. Obviously, we're not going to agree on this, but I'll just tell you one more example. You made a great point. I'm saying you made great points. You're saying really good points. I mean, this is things that he's going to be thinking about for, for weeks, maybe months, maybe years. But I'm just saying, right, you know, like in the creation story, right, it says it says Elohim, and he used Elohim all the way up until the the whole thing with Cain and Abel, right? And then that's the first time we see the UK above Cain. No, we see, Why? It, we see it way before that, in chapter 2, in your version. Okay, it would be chapter 2, verse 4, way before Cain and Abel. I could be I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, it's only around the time of Cain and Abel that it starts, the Shem starts to use UK above Cain. No, his, Am name I wrong? his name is mentioned way before that. What's the, what's the earliest what's the earliest by you then maybe i mean i'm not trying to put you on the spot if you feel you, it's different maybe you for can... you it would be genesis chapter two and verse four for two us first still four. part of verse chapter one but for you it would be genesis chapter two, two and four for you yeah i don't know what two uh, and four two and four genesis chapter two verse four is what so it would by be us you. it only says elohim right here it only says elohim so my knowledge in the Hebrew, it doesn't say that. I'm looking at the Hebrew. It says Elohim. Read it. Read it. That's her, oh, no, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. It says Hashem Elohim. You're right. You're right. You're right. It says Hashem Elohim. You're yeah, totally it's right. There. It's there. That's the first time. No, you're right. You're right. It says Hashem Elohim. You're right. You're absolutely right. You're right That's again. The first time the name and is. You know, you haven't been wrong once. So I can't deny that. But um, I guess what I meant to say, not Cain and Abel, but by man, it says you're capable of things. But you're right. You're all right. I meant to say by man. I thought I, but you're, I was wrong. That's it. Even uh, Adam's wife says it before there was the two brothers. Well, the birth of the first brother, she says his name. No, you're right. You're right. But it's just interesting that Hashem doesn't reveal his name until it's associated with people. It talks about all the different animals and, and land and heaven. It doesn't say Yoke Bubke. It just says Elohim. But well, we, then believe, when you get to... we believe chapter two and four is really still part of chapter one. And he's mentioning or declaring his name on the Shabbat day. That's what makes that day so special. Is that all previous mm -hmm. previous six days it was just Elohim or you know Elohim the way mm -hmm. you say it. But on the seventh day when he rested, that's when he declared his name. He stamped that day with his name. That's what makes that day so holy. Is that he uh -huh. put his name on it. That for us, that's how we view it, the text. For other people, they think chapter two is this whole other creation story, different from chapter one. For us, mm -hmm. that's you know, verse four of chapter two is still part of the seven days. This is the seventh day when he declared his name to make that day set mm -hmm. apart from all the other days. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I just want to say one thing real quick. I looked up in the Samaritan version and I don't know, uh, it doesn't have the vocalization of the Samaritan, but it's spelled hey, sav, ayin, hey, not vav. So like and you the, said, and the bob at the singular. end is what makes it plural. Right. It's not there. Right, right, right. Pentateuch. It seems to be singular, like you said. So so you're right. But um, I just want to say one more thing. Um, uh, the chapters were added by the Christians. The Jews did not add the chapters. So they didn't have anything. They didn't have much to do with that. But yeah. I agree. That's, That's why cool. in the Septuagint, there's no, there's no chapters and verses, to my knowledge. Um, in a normal... Yeah. Version of Septuagint. Little... The Jews not had nothing to do with that. But you're right. No, you you so you're so right, man. Look, I said you're you're obviously a scholar uh, of the first rate, obviously. Um, I guess I just have a couple more questions. Really, I'm okay. skip to the point. It was really what I know about is Gabari. Okay. Um, first, am I saying the name correctly? Gabara, Gabare. How do you say it? Excuse me. The first the first sound. Is a rattled guttural sound, like your are oh. water. Yeah. Okay. Still preserved in Arabic, but it's lost in modern Hebrew, lost in Masoretic Hebrew. The ayin became a became a sort of a class A vowel later in late Hebrew, but if we look at the transliterations of the ancient text, it was still a consonant, still a guttural fricative consonant. So, and we see that when other nations are trying to describe us, like when the Egyptians describe us, with they call us Hebrew, there's still that guttural consonant in the beginning. When the Akkadians did it, it was still there. So we're not trying to invent something new. We're simply returning to the way the word was pronounced prior to the, the iron being lost, you know, lenition taking place and the iron being becoming just a straight A-class vowel or a, you know, an E vowel in modern Hebrew, it's Ivrit, right? But for us, that's a guttural consonant. So it's Rab, Rabare is how we pronounce the word Hebrew. Rabare, very interesting. Rabare. Rabare. So, you know, of course, in Tamanin, they still have the sounds 
um, and, the, and the Samaritans, um, I believe the Samaritans still have this sound, to my knowledge. Um, Ian is still is a, a sound. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Okay. My other question would be um, the vocalization system. So tell me mm-hmm. if I understand this incorrectly. So um, let's let's stick to that um, Genesis uh, 2 and 4. Is that okay? Sure. Where we were at before. We were at Genesis 2 and 4. So the way I understand it, um, most consonants, so let's say um, Hashemayim, right? Hashemayim, the third word in the verse. Mm-hmm. Most consonants are going to be uh, in, in a vowel sound of like a, 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 a sound, right? Like sha, sha, ma. Is that true? And um, why only is that when true? They're, and only when why? They're not. We believe that the vowels have to be written and the only inherent or non-written vowel will be a class A vowel. So we have vowels. We don't know ones people saying they were like the Lashuan Kudesh or whatever the hell you call it. Where they have no vowels, or they claim not to have one, but they have one yeah, eye. Yeah, you know, they they have eye. Yeah. So, but they say there's no vowels, but they have that eye. But you know, they, they just contradict themselves. So we have more than one vowel. We've got we've got four pure vowels that we use, but those vowels must be written. They can't just be assumed, right? They have to be written. The only only vowel we assume that doesn't have to be written is an A class vowel. Okay. So we would pronounce that word heaven as hashemem, hashemem. 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 The heavens. Hashemem. Hashemem. So let me ask you a question. So, so, um, absent a, I'm sure I'm going to butcher these names, but absent a ha, is that correct? A ha, uh, a, a wa. Is that how they pronounce? Or no, that's not how these letters are pronounced. I'm saying when trying to say hey and Bob. When we're just like when we're just mentioning the letters and actually not putting them into words, okay, we simply add an A-class vowel at the end. So it's ah ba ga and so forth. And the reason why we do that, I know the camps want to take credit for that, but they can't, is when you go back and you look at the manuscripts, the first time the letters were given names, like Aleph, Bet, Gimel, okay. That's coming from the Phoenicians and the Canaanites. They gave these letters these names. We don't see that in the Torah. We don't see it in the prophets. We don't see it anywhere else except outside of the Bible when it's being when those letters are being described by Canaanites. You can look at the Ugaritic documents. They'll, they'll have these names for these letters, but that's Canaanite. In our own tradition, our own books, our own holy books, we do not find the letters being given names, just like we don't find the days of the week being given names and numbers, right? Our days don't have names. They're just numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. So our letters don't have names either. So we just simply pronounce them with a basic A, a, a class vowel and call it a day. Ah, ba, ga, da, ha. Same thing in English where they have A, B, C. Those aren't names. Those are simply the sounds that each letter makes before, before they're put into words. Okay. But when you put them in the words, they don't, they don't all, they're not all going to sound like that. Ah, 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 ah. That's not, that's not what's going to happen. Because you're going to have vowels written and the vowel combined with the consonant is going to form its own syllable. Okay. Okay. Um. All right. I think I understand. So the only yeah, letter I, that I know for sure. Yeah, go I've ahead. I've seen um. You know that uh, I haven't seen. I, I'm banned from Facebook <laughs> because my belligerent uh non uh, what do you call it community standard keeping self gets gets uh, put in Facebook jail. But I've seen some of your posts where you're just trying to describe our language and it's not. Correct. I don't mind the. What the do attacks. I have wrong? Tell me what I'm wrong. Tell me. Well, just tell me what I'm. Just correct me. That's, okay. I find well, that me, more helpful. Let me just say yeah. that I don't mind the attacks. I expect that. I welcome it because we need that. We need the criticism to be able to, you know, respond to it and 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 get get our message across. But mm-hmm. just like if I were to criticize someone else's doctrine, I take it upon myself to know exactly what they're talking about before I criticize because I don't want to misrepresent their views. Because that's what people mm-hmm. do. They misrepresent your view and they think they're debunking you. Instead, they're not. They're just creating a straw man. So I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, I try to, before I criticize anybody, I make sure I know exactly what they're talking about, what they believe, and I can repeat what they say correctly without changing anything. And that's all I ask of you that's, or anyone is that before you criticize, spend some time to, so that you know exactly what it is that we're saying. And you might be talking to one of my students that may not know. 
you might be talking to one of my beginners and they may, you know, get stuff wrong. But you need to, <sighs> you need to, you need to spend some time, give us a serious look, not just some cursory, uh, you know, dismissive look before you start to criticize and, and because that only just creates more of a problem, especially when, you know, I, I meet you and now we're, we're you know, bumping heads instead of we're having a, you know, a mature conversation. It, it prevents a mature dialogue because now we're adversaries. You're, you're saying stuff that I know is not true and I'm coming at you trying to, you know, rebut you. And it's like this, you know, that's where I have to be, you know, violent <laughs> because now you're my adversary. Whereas opposed to, where if you had came at me as saying, look, I heard this, is this true? And I want to get some clarity on that. My whole demeanor and approach would be different. Completely I mean, different. I tell this to my wife. I tell this to my wife, right? If I'm apologizing to you, you don't have to pile on. I'm here talking to you. And obviously you've given me your time. And I and I want to thank you for that. But I'm that's why I'm here. No, I appreciate so that. You don't need to say, well, you don't need to say all that because that's why I'm here. And, 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 and I appreciate you felt that you need to say that. And you have the right to say that. No, because that, that's but what's honestly, happened in the past. That's why. But let me finish. I, I'll let you talk. Let me please let me just say this one thing with respect. I'm saying I, I attack, I did not, first of all, it's not your, if it's really a true reconstruction of ancient language, it's not your personal creation. So it's not attack on you. It, it is, it was what it is. No, I'm never, I never take it personal. Have, I'm I, talking about I, the accuracy of the attack. Is the attack can accurate? Can I finish? Can I talk? Yeah, just give me like, give me like two minutes to talk. I'm saying, what? I'm saying it's not a personal attack on anybody. It's either true or it's not. Either it's more closer to what, or it's closer to what the original was, or it's not. We know that no, you know, uh, the Masoretic text, it can't be a perfect uh, pres preservation of what was. It can't be because we're humans. Some things are going to be forgotten or misunderstood just from generation to generation. Some things are going to be misunderstood. It's just natural. Also, there's shifts of, of pronunciation like how French became the sound so different from all the other Latin languages, right? There's shift of pronunciation that can easily happen. This is my point. My point is that's why I'm here. And it wasn't, it's not an attack on anybody. And so there's no reason for me to feel like, uh, 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 in my opinion, for you to feel like I'm attacking you or anybody yeah. else. Yeah, I didn't say that. It, it, just give me a second. And also, if you have this gabaret or whatever, you, uh, you know, gabaret, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, murdered, I just murdered that pronunciation. My point is, it is an attack on the Masoretic. And you say the Masoretic, I, believe, I hold by the Masoretic text, but only the consonants. That's not the Masoretic. What makes the Masoretic special and different is that it's a preservation, not only the consonants, but of the vowels. And if you reject the vowels, you're attacking the basically the linchpin of really all of not only Judaism, but also Christianity. This is this, the, the basis of all this is the Masoretic text. Right. Well, That's the one thing that, that everybody that agrees on. True. No, no, it's not. A, it's not my belief. The entire King James Bible, which is the most popular Bible in the world, the English which Bible, is probably the English Bible. Like I said, is based on the Masoretic and the, it's based on the Masoretic understanding of what these words say. And it's different based on the vocalization. As you know, you, you talked about the grammar says, ooh, so on and so forth. It's not only the consonants, but the dots and dashes. That's all I got to say. Yeah, I talked for a, a long time, and thank you for letting me speak. But it's not—it's not an attack on you or anybody else. Either it's true or it's not. I never take these attacks personal because no one knows me. They haven't really talked to me in person. I'm talking about the actual the doctrine itself, apart from me. But you're right. I mean, I am attacking the Masoretic vocalization, and, and I am in doing so attacking Judaism, I'm attacking Christianity, I'm attacking all of it. That's true. That is true. <clears throat> but yeah, we don't, we don't, uh, we're not a fan of the King James at all. We hate that book. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're right. It was based on the King James. They did get the manuscripts from <clears throat> the Masoretic text to make that translation. They didn't use the Septuagint for every verse. Very true. I mean, to my understanding, all the popular Bibles right now, you get the NIV. You got a few others. I don't know all the, the ones, but I just did a search. And like the top five Bibles, they're all based on mostly on the Masoretic text. Some of them, like you said, use Samaritan. They'll bring the Samaritan in some places. They'll bring the Septuagint. They'll bring the Vulgate, and they'll bring the um, the um, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls in some places where they feel like that's more correct. That's but anyway, I mean, based. I mean, if you really have, if this, if this is really true, 
you changed the entire world. If you if, if you really had reconstructed the true pronunciation of the ancient original text, you've changed the entire world forever. If it's really true, and we'll you know, know that it's, if it's the very significant. We'll know that if very the prophecies play themselves out. Right now, I don't expect anyone to just jump on and believe it. We'll know that if the prophecies are fulfilled. I have a question. I do have another question, though. Um, basically, I have one more question. I know these questions are super long, and I appreciate your time. But um, I guess my next question would be, um, so I understand I talked to one of your students a while, while ago, and honestly, I didn't give it much thought. But he basically explained to me that it's based on um, transliteration of how other people be it the Greeks, be, be it the Syrians, be it the Egyptians, other people that encountered the ancient Hebrews, I'm going to use the word Hebrew, yeah. uh, are Israelites. They, how they understood what they heard, that's what you use to reconstruct the pronunciations of the pure language. Is that true? Yeah. And linguistically, that's the only real way you can get a solid grasp on it. It's just like if you take a Japanese word and you, and you see it in the script, Okay, you and I speak English. We don't know how to speak Japanese. Someone's going to have to take that Japanese word and transliterate it into English letters, and then we can sound it out. We may, we may not know what it means, but now we can pronounce the word. And then someone else can tell, you know, someone can tell us what that means. But in order to pronounce that Japanese word, someone has to transliterate it into the language or the, you know, the letters that we know how to sound out. And then we can actually sound out that Japanese word. So in ancient Hebrew, the ancient Hebrews were not an isolated people. They interacted with lots of different people. They interacted with the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Akkadians, and all these people were isolated. You know, they weren't all sharing notes. So whenever they transliterated a Hebrew word, and those transliterations agree phonetically, that is solid evidence for how that word was pronounced. Because they're not all in some room, you know, sharing notes and comparing each other. They're working independently of each other, and they're transliterating the same word, and they're all coming up with the same phonetic rendering of the word. That's evidence of how that word was pronounced. And I'm telling you, I mean, you may not agree with me, but a lot of times, most of the times, this evidence is in, is, is, um, in conflict with the Masoretic vocalization. And I'm not the only one who says that. So you, you may hear me say it, say that's just your opinion. It's not just my opinion. There's several scholars. I wouldn't say that. Yeah, that's this, not something I would say, by the okay, way. Okay, thank you. But there are several scholars. I respect, who, your, I respect the opinion. Opinion is the, is the most powerful thing. Yeah, so several scholars have said what I've said. It's just that when I say it, folks think, you know, you know, I'm the first person that ever said that, and they think I'm crazy, da da da. But that's it's not just me, the only one that's saying that. Would you be able to give me an example? I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but would you be able to show me an example? Is there an easy example you can show me? Well, I just gave you one. The, or, word, Hebrew, the word Hebrew, for example. Okay. In modern well, Hebrew, the, the reason, words of, go ahead. Well, well, we already said that. That, that guttural sound has been lost, but certain people still have it, like the Yemenites, right? That guttural sound has been lost, but uh, for most people, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, we said that basically we're reconstructing the original pronunciation based on transliteration of foreign peoples, right? Yeah. So I guess that's is there a way you can, like, to my knowledge, like you have, you know, you have uh, Israel mentioned in a, uh, you have like a Moabite text. I know there's an Egyptian text that had Israel in, in hieroglyphs. We couldn't reconstruct it from hieroglyphs because the hieroglyphs did not have sounds that we know of associated with them. Is that true? And then you had the Moabites. So the Moabites did have Israel. It talked about defeating a, a, a king of Judah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Or like what samples are we? All right. Well, let's deal with the first one. The, the uh, Mernopta Stele, which is the one you're saying mentions Israel. Uh, actually, there's a number of scholars now that dispute that, that that does not actually mention the name Israel, that that was just a rush to judgment by the 19th century guy who found that monument. So there's, okay. there's not universal agreement that Israel is being mentioned in that text. It also doesn't fit the rest of the passage. The second one, the Moabite stone, you know, we don't have it today. It's lost. Some people think it was a forgery because we can't actually examine the original. It's gone. Um, but in that, it's simply going to transcribe, you know, it's going to write the word as with the way we spelled it because Moabite and Canaanite and Hebrew were you know, very, very, very similar. Very so similar, you right. You can't use that to, to extract phonetics. You have to use a, a completely different system to, to extract phonetics. Um, because the Semitic language doesn't normally have the, the phonetics, but right? we don't have the vocalization. 
in ancient. Like, you have to know it before saying, you right? lost. You okay, I got it. you. That's yeah. the, that's the biggest problem I have with with uh, Guy Barre is so, is that so what we, issue. Yeah. So, yeah. So like, go ahead, please. So this is what I'm saying. If you don't if you don't know the system, you look at a Semitic text, you're lost. That's why the Masoretes added the Nikud, so that when their students read it, they wouldn't be lost. They they could see what to what what sounds to put where. But if before that, if you're just looking at a straight West Semitic text, if you don't know the rules, you're lost. You don't know how to sound on that. You can't extract phonetics from that. You have to know it or you don't. So what do we do? How do we find those? How do we find those rules? We have to go. We have to find a a a, a, tra a transliteration where a Hebrew word is put in a completely different system, writing system, completely different. Okay. So I looked at the Medonet or the Egyptian. I looked at the Akkadian. Okay. I looked at the um, the the uh, uh, Ugaritic and the Aramaic and the Demotic and the Greek and the Latin, all of them. <laughs> Excuse me. Is there a way I could find like a full list of all the all the, the texts that were used? Used for what? For me? Well, for we're talking about, you know, how how. Well, let me let me start with this. Is it true that that you are were the one who was the one who re was able to reconstruct this ancient pronunciation. Is that correct or no? It was yeah, other people yeah. also. It was a team of people. No, or was yourself the main person? Okay, so is there a way I could look at the, the list of texts? And, and by the way, you've been very respectful with, with me, um, and I'm gonna look to always be respectful with you, to you going forward. I'm gonna. I mean, Shalom. how Peace can I not be? How can I not be? You show me nothing but respect, and you give me your time to try to answer my question. So, <laughs> but I, it would be nice if, if I could see a list of each um, transliteration that you that that you use and look at it for myself. It would be much, you know, it'd be very convincing. Well, I don't have like you know? a, you know, I'm still in the process of writing a grammar text and also a lexicon that's going to take me a while. But I do have very very time consuming. I'm sure. Yeah, but I do have sources with respect to the name, and that's that's the like foundation of what I everything I do is based on the name. And I do have sources for that, and I'll be happy to share it with you. Give me your email address; I'll email it to you. It's fine. I'll give you. I'll give you. Uh, I'll give you an email. I'll I'll, I'll I'll reach out to you. Um, but uh, you know, as a Jew, like I said, the reason you know why Jews are so hesitant. Because at least by us, the way we read the Torah, it's very strong. There's no need. There's no need to use Yud K Vav K in general. Like there's no there's no mitzvah to use Yud K Vav K. There's like there's no such mitzvah in the Torah. There is the very anywhere first that one. you must. Which one? The very, the very first one of the ten. First, the very first mitzvah is is be fruitful and multiply in the Torah. No, no, I mean the uh, of the ten commandments. What's the first one? What's the first one of the ten? Ah, the ten understands. Um. Uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. You have to tell me. I'm drawing a blank the right first now. First one is to know his name. That's a that's a a positive commandment, a positive law. The rest of them, or most of them after that, are negative commandments. But the first one is to know his name. Um, to... but that's not how we read it. You should have no other gods before me. No, no, that's the second one. Which means that's the second one. Exodus twenty and three. Yeah, the very first one is I am. Such and such and such, the one who brought you out of Egypt. That's the first commandment. Then the second one is, you should have no other gods before me, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the first so, one so is, clearly we... I am such and such. That's the first commandment. We have to know that. Who he how is. is that, how is that a commandment? Why is that a commandment? Well, for one thing, you have to establish the person speaking. Who is the one telling you that you must do A, B, C, D, E, F, G? What's his name? Why does he have this authority? He tells you in the very first commandment. This is my name. This is what I did, right? And I have the right, therefore, to tell you, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So the why is one, that incumbent on, on, oh, sorry, sorry, please continue. I'm going to wait no, for I'm, just, I'm just saying for us, I know it's not maybe how you would see it, but for us, right, the foundation of everything is his name. And we go from there. And that's, it's not the end, though. It's not the end of the story. Obviously, there's a lot more after that. But we start right there. But at the very beginning, this is who he is. This is his name. This is what he did for us by bringing us out of Matram or Misraim, the way you would pronounce it. And that's why we have to listen to him and do what he says. Because he identifies himself by name and by act. And that's the that's we start there. And we don't stop there. That's not the end of all, end of it all. But that's the, you know, 
square one. That's where we start with square one. I guess, I guess what I would say is that that's a very good point. And it's very, very, very well thought out. It's just, you know, from a juice perspective, we're looking for an ase or a low ase, right? I'm sure you, I'm sure I'm saying it weird by you because you're, you're, you know, a Hebrew speaker, uh, uh, Sephardic Hebrew speaker. But, you know, we're looking for a, a do or a don't do, right? So for us, where's the do? You know, you must, where's the verse that says, like, you know, you shall use my name. The only time we that I know of that it says you must use the name of Hashem is when um, by the woman who has been suspected of adultery, right? The Sota, right? That the, the name of Hashem is written. I believe it says it. I think it says it in the verse. I have to check. But the name of Hashem is written on a piece of paper and then it's grounded up into a powder and like put into uh, water. But there's no other time that we say like, I understand the importance of the name. I understand the importance of the name to your group and um, your people. But like I'm saying, like looking at the text, you know, where's that emphasis that we must use this name in any certain kind of way? Where's the commandment? You know, and I, I just don't see that. It's in, uh, you can look at Deuteronomy or Devarim chapter 6, verse okay. 13, where we are commanded to use his name when we make oaths. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Also, chapter 10, verse 20, he tells us. Shmo tish shway. Okay, so, okay. So when you swear, when you have, when you swear. And that we oath. say that that means by a court. That means by a court because the other places it says you shouldn't swear or you really like, right? It says you really shouldn't. You no, shouldn't swear. We, every time we make an oath, we can invoke his name and we have to keep our oath. Whenever you invoke uh -huh. his name in an oath, you can't go back on it. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, you Do you still use the partial system at all or not anymore? No. I mean, I still vaguely know it, but I'm far gone from that. Okay. I got you. Um, mm, well, I don't have it right handy. So well, you should I'll just say, look, okay. You should, you should ask. I mean, I'm not, you know, you should ask what, what, how do the, you know, in, oh, in for sure Orthodox, I will. how do they number the Ten Commandments? What's the actual very first one? Second, third, and fourth. You should have no other. We said the first one is just like the Christian. We have the same number as the Christian because yeah, they got man. it from the Jews. So they just copied it from the Jews directly. You should have no other gods before me, which basically means no idolatry. But that's actually that's the, the first second commandment in Judaism. Well, commandment, no, the, the, so the 10 utterances are, to my knowledge, um, all the 10 utterances, we call the 10 utterances, all of them are listed uh, before, to my knowledge. I could be wrong. Every single commandment in the 10 utterances is already listed previously. So, like, the way that Jews understand the 10 commandments is that it's a synopsis of the 600, you know, we Jews say we 613 mitzvahs, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, it's kind of like Rabbi Hillel, you know, standing on the foot. If you had to, you know, teach me the Torah standing on one foot, says, you know, treat other people the way you want to be treated. It's like that. It's not, it's, it's not, you can't, it's not a real commandment because you can't quantify how do you treat other people they want to be treated. How do you know how somebody wants to be treated? It means it's, it's, it's a, a moral imperative. You should try to treat people, you know, kindly. But you it's not a commandment story? because... Sorry, give me a second. Here we give me a second. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah, Decalogue. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the very first commandment. Anoki Hashem. Anoki Hashem. I see this. Ah, oh, I see this. Ah, you do it. Anoki Hashem. I am Hashem. And the second commandment. I am Hashem, but. What's the but, second one? Lo Yeh. Right. But Anoki you Hashem. Will not, you will not have, you have any other gods before me, though. You have all the That's gods. the second ah. commandment. The first one is, uh, I am for you, Hashem. The name is the first commandment. Hmm. That's a good point. And this is coming from the okay. website here is from Jewish learning, you know, they're, but they're all, all the same. All the same. Mm. Any, any synagogue, you see okay. the Decalogue presented like this, the very first one is the name. Mm. You must know his name. That's why it's so important to us to know his name. Uh. Well, I can't. I can't really argue with that. I. I, I don't understand. I don't. I don't. Uh, you should present it as, as it is. So I can't really say too much about that. But um. 
I am a shen. I am a shen. Like, I don't know if that's okay. Okay. Very interesting. So I feel I have to run, but this has been great. Thank you for your time. All right. We can talk again. Uh, Anytime you have a question. You gave me plenty of time. You got plenty of time, and I really can't fault you. Yeah, I really yeah. appreciate uh, you get give me. No, you gave me more than you gave, you gave me more. Yeah, I appreciate you let me speak. I'm happy I got a chance to hear you speak. Put your mic. I think you muted yourself by accident. Oh yeah, no, I I really appreciate your time. You gave me one more time than than uh, I think I really deserved from you. I'm sure you're very busy. No, no, um, no. And, and great... obviously. I think that uh, clearly you're very, very, very um, intelligent. You're clearly very, very well studied. And uh, it's very sad to me that you left Yiddishkeit. Um, it's very sad to me that you went a different way. Um, but, you know, it seems like you're doing very well. And, and, and so much success to you. Okay. Let's talk again soon. All right. All right. Take care. Okay. Take care. All the best.